to light a footnote to you know, Peter's incredibly insightful account. Uh, number one, I think there is a bigger issue of agency, and that is the, the more we adopt machines, you know, automation and artificial intelligence, we have a tendency to equate humans to those new emerging entities, right? But to me, that's the wrong question to ask because how we treat emerging technology is a lot more about how we treat each other, other human beings, right? So you know, Peter, you know, uses this analogy quite a bit. And, you know, I can relate to it a lot of times. And that is, when I don't get the right answer from my Siri or Alexis, right? I get mad at it, right? You know, I, I, I want to like to destroy it, right? And at some point, I realized that it has nothing to do with the technology, but essentially is my own anger management, right? So a lot of times, we just delegate that agency to the technology as opposed to accepting the agency that we have the way to shape how we interface with machines, technologies, like robotics, and so on and so forth, right? So that's my first footnote. And the second footnote is a little bit more dystopian to use the theme of this webinar. And that is, it's really about different political systems approaching this human machine relationship at this point, right? So how much we weaponize this against humanity? To me, that is the fundamental public policy question of our times, right? So we still have the agency to shape this relationship. And that is really the genius of this book, right? If you look at the final scene of this book, you will actually come to realize this footnote. And that is, we are humanizing more machines and more technologies. And to me, that is not troubling. Actually, that is the most humanizing aspect of this book, perhaps, right? Because that says a lot more about our humanity, right? than the cunning genius of the machines that we create. So two footnotes, just to recap my sort of, you know, uh, take on this issue. One, you know, for civil affairs, right? To me, civil affairs is the perfect conduit between national security and domestic politics, right? And also it is the perfect conduit between technology and the human domain, right? How we shape that nexus, right? It's really about where we go with our political sensibilities. And to me, the nexus of great power competition is whether we define that nexus, but we let non-democratic forces, such as authoritarian regimes who are visiting states, right, shape that nexus. To me, that is perhaps one of the most important questions of our times. And that will dictate whether the projection of this book becomes utopian or dystopian. So I, I like to jump right on there, and that's the, this is exactly what we're talking about. And this the, the systems versus it, and, and within this world, China is not the CCP; it's a different entity. But they specifically touched on that uh, in the U.S. version. This 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 great panopticon of the ability to see everything is different. Actors have different access. And there's a very limited view that the U.S. government gets within our system of government in this novel versus what the, the public sphere, the private firms, the, the tech corporation, Silicon Valley gets. Now, I'd ask this, uh, Peter. Do you see that divergence continuing? Do you continue to see that the, the private sector, the non-state actors, the actual multinational corporations are going to have a greater view of the panopticon and due to the, the – once again, the asymmetry that is, uh, that is beholden and inherent to being a democracy within the sharp power construct is going to limit the ability of the U.S. government and similar democracies in using this panopticon of PAI and AI to actually look into the lives of our citizens. I think what you see as part of this larger um, strategic competition with China is, um, you know, there's, there's the the hard power military side of it, but there's um, competing visions of uh, how you develop and utilize AI. Um, and, you know, and, th and this is also a, the, the models will be something playing out um, in terms of their uh, trying to sell it, so to speak, to uh, states caught in the middle of this, this competition. 
So you have the China model, which is um, highly centralized, government-led, um, where the government is not only choosing which of its corporations are going to be national champions, um, but also in turn is enforcing a level of information sharing that will be fairly seamless. Uh, and that is the, the goal of it is a, um, a combined domestic and abroad. Um, it's, a, it's about control, uh, it's a social credit system. Uh, you know, the idea that um, you will have a single score of your trustworthiness in the eye of the government, and then that score is drawn from tracking all of your activities, from whether you buy diapers to what you post online to how long you play a video game. And in turn, that score is um, used as uh, to determine micro to macro rewards and punishments, everything from uh, free charging of your cell phone at a coffee shop to uh, whether you get um, a bed on an overnight train all the way up to um, your score goes into your internet dating profile and it will determine whether you get matched with someone attractive or not. Um, so a, a centralized, fairly seamless model. By contrast, um, we've got a cacophony. Um, we have a government AI strategy. Um, within that government AI strategy, we've got a defense department strategy. Oh, by the way, you all know that just because you've got a defense department strategy doesn't mean that it's seamless within DOD, right? Um, and uh, in, within that, the information sharing, even in that system, some of it will be quite fluid and some of it will not. Um, you know, so the, the opening scene of the book has, um, it's so strange to see it play out this week in DC. Um, it, it notes that, um, Washington DC has 46 different uh, federal law enforcement agencies that are allowed to operate in the city. Um, and that is um, in the scene, the reason why when a crisis happens, they all show up with their own gear, their comms don't talk all that well, they have different training. Um, and, uh, you know, we feel confident that that will continue to be the case 15 years out. Uh, that, you know, uh, yes, one military unit may have something, but a different, you know, you see it right now in DC um, in how the different federal units that have been, legal units have been deployed. Um, some of them are wearing insignia, some of them are not. They're acting differently. Some are abusive, some are not. It's a, it's a to put it bluntly, a shit show. Um, and that's, uh, straight, you know, what I'm getting at is even within government, we have a cacophony of information sharing and the like. And then, oh, by the way, you've got each of the large technology companies that are each working on their AI, you know, Google's program versus Facebook's program versus Amazon. They're not sharing data with each other on it. And so what it means is, um, I believe, uh, you will have some situations where government will have more data on you than maybe private sector and in other situations, private sector will have a greater awareness of you. Um, and it might be determined by the pattern of your type of activity, or it might be literally where you are geographically um, will be shaped by this. And oh, by the way, you also have very different, um, we already see some areas pushing back against this. So, uh, you know, we're, the, the great thing of the book is, um, you know, I'm not just saying it, I can give you the, the research to show it, the footnote. So like college campuses are starting to be a, a key area of pushback against face recognition technology. So when you ask like, um, you know, who will have a, a, someone, a, a police officer who is operating in the street will have last access to data when they go onto a college campus. Um, that won't be the situation in Beijing. Yeah, I'll just add a quick footnote. And um, again, you know, it's really hard to add value going after like, you know, Peter. So let me try my best anyhow. And um, so I think, you know, uh, James, what you're asking is this lag or, you know, perhaps tension between industry and like, you know, public stakeholders, right? Where, you know, in the rest of the world, that tension seems a little bit more streamlined. I'm looking at the CCP, I'm looking at the Kremlin, right? And of course, you know, there is a little bit more coherence between industry stakeholders and perhaps, you know, how would that be, right? 
And sometimes we get very impatient because we seem to essentially behind the power curve in that regard. My take on this issue between industry and government is slightly different. This is essentially a blessing in disguise because we are open society. This delay is affording us a little bit more space to reflect and shape that machine-human partnership that this book is so articulate about. Does it make sense? Because I don't think that's a public policy space we can rush into, right, and come up with a convenient determination because that's what the CCP has done. That's what the Kremlin has done, right? So thinking about the social credit system, where did it come from? It came from Alibaba, right? Essentially, it's the same as Amazon's rating system, right? So essentially, the absence of open debate close that space, right, where we can shape how that relationship should look like in the long run. So we get very impatient with our democratic principles and institutions, and we always feel like we're too slow. We need to you know, catch up to this revision space. I think that's a wrong mindset in terms of how we try to shape this human-machine relationship, right? where we serve the former, not the later, right? So in that regard, yes, I am frustrated from time to time, but I actually like to you know, welcome this white space, right? Where we get to debate, like we are doing right now, right? Because we have great thinkers like you know, August Cole and Peter Singer, we are creating this space to debate this issue, right? As opposed to letting some goons, right, in a palace, determine the relationship for the rest of us, right? I think that's precisely where we shouldn't go. Does it make sense? So, you know, what I want to add here is that let's essentially like, you know, welcome this white space, right? Let's welcome this debate we're creating with Peter Singer and August Cole, right? and try to have more proactive agency in terms of shaping how we want to essentially employ these tools to support this great power competition, because to me, this is really about how we shape how our kids and grandchildren approach civil liberties, right, in the next 10, 30 years. Was that too heavy? Did I go yeah, too far? Actually, I've got kind of a follow-up. Uh... No, I just started sipping a new gin and tonic, so I think I can handle it. Without that, no, though. Um, I do have kind of a tangential question of that related um, to what you were talking about. But Peter, I was wondering, you know, as this sort of technology breaks down the perceived importance of what we used to uh, talk about with traditional geographic boundaries and political borders, do you foresee United States law and like domestic authorities adapting to that change? I guess in the sense of, is the U.S. government going to ensure it gathers enough information to domestically protect the homeland uh, without at the same time kind of violating privacy laws and civil liberties? Like, how do you think that uh, paradigm sort of plays out as we look into, you know, 2040, 2050? Um, my concern, frankly, is the opposite direction. Uh, I think the um, level of data that is gathered is is you know going to continue to grow um i think for the most well, well it may not feel that to you i think for the most part um our challenges are not about access to data um i think it's more about how i put it to use i think it's only going to grow um in particular uh in a sort of post coronavirus environment where um, the, the justification for gathering data will now have a public health side to it. I mean, look, you know, not merely your medical record, but your movements, mm -hmm. um, who you interacted with, you know, I mean, I, I just, we, and, and clearly we already see that that's being rolled out right now. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, as you all well know, once you start to gather it for one purpose, you can, you can then deploy it for others. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we're, we're seeing 
things that were supposed to be for drug investigations being deployed against protesters right now, stuff like that. Um, it's funny, I, I was many years back part of the, um, I, I got to sit in on a meeting of the drone industry where they were trying to figure out how to deploy, how to get um, drones authorized to be used by um, police departments in the US. And they basically came to the conclusion that the way to do it was to get a couple of use cases of um, lost little girls in uh, wilderness or the desert. Uh, and then a drone would invariably find them. And then once they could have that use case to talk about, it would crack open the market for police forces. It worked. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I guess I'm not concerned as much about the sort of geographic division. I think we, we, we can figure that out. Um, I think it's more the, the flip side of, uh, who gets access to that data. And again, what's interesting about it is it, it, it goes over into, um, back to that prior question about the, the public private division. Um, we've already seen right now, um, coronavirus, uh, contact tracing, uh, for public health reasons was also being passed on to Foursquare to be used to back to a prior question to micro target against you for advertising. It's, um, it feels, you know, yeah. very dystopian and it happened already. It didn't take us but a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, if I may like, you know, add like, you know, a quick observation there, you know, Kevin, and that it is, um, again, you know, probably we can look at the same issue from a very different angle, and, and that it is, I always try to think about, you know, um, the, the counterfactual, right? And, and that it is, what do we gain by, get, you know, by, by getting more access to this high fidelity, you know, data, as opposed to finding solutions to safeguard them, right? And uh, as you may know, I've been one of the key uh, authors of resistance theory in the soft community, right? And um, one of my primary concerns over the years um, has been what we can do to support, right? Resistance movements against perhaps the CCP and the Kremlin in contested areas, right? Where the Kremlin and CCP will not hesitate to use high fidelity, personally identifiable information to target perhaps dissidents, right? Or like, you know, uh, democratic movements and et cetera, right? So again, I think this is where, you know, um, this book is so incredibly insightful because toward the end, you will notice a few mentions of quantum encryption or blockchain technology to preserve some essential aspects of privacy, right? While we are using, you know, the same technologies to serve public goods, right? And to me, this is a critical, like, you know, shiva of this issue, right? And that is, if we go too offensive about employing these technologies because we are hasty, right? We end up shooting ourselves in the foot because our partners, right? state and non-state partners overseas will not be able to hide or preserve what they're doing to their primary adversaries, in this case, the Kremlin and the CCP. And I can tell you from firsthand experiences, this is perhaps one of the most pressing operational problem sets for a lot of our friends overseas, right? So let's just say, you know, I've been to every Baltic state, right? I've, been, I've worked with every single Baltic state government, right? What do they worry about the most, right? They're trying to organize resiliency, right? But they're afraid that the Kremlin is using, you know, OSINT, PAI, and PII, right, to essentially expose what they're preparing to resist in the first place. And I don't think we're doing us any favor, right, by going too hasty about fully embracing the offensive side of emerging technologies. Um, so recently we published a civil affairs specific reading list and, uh, while this episode is about burn-in, um, Dr. Singer's Life War made the reading list, um, about the weaponization of social media. So two quick questions for Dr. Singer, then kick it off to Cheech for the last question. Uh, talking about that weaponization of social media, uh, 
what appetite is there within the DOD to decentralize uh, information campaigns in the chain of command uh, for the use of like Twitter bots, similar to like what we saw in the uh, retaking of Mosul in your in, in the intro to the book. Second question is, uh, has the value of open source uh, intelligence uh, increased? over the last couple of years since you published the book or is it remain the same? Um, on the first question, you know, you are better equipped to answer that than I, my sense is, um, uh, we're still not there. I mean, so I've, I've done, you know, briefings for various units, but also, um, a series of, uh, you know, senior leader, sessions um like the some of them are you know in a four-star level and others are like the um they've got different names but they're basically the the exec ed courses that new three or new four stars get um and you know i i come in and get an hour to talk about like war and the like and um i think senior leaders get the the growing importance of this space one i think they too get that we're not doing well at it still. They have that frustration. Um, I think though, when you, you know, and we'll, I'll sometimes talk about that idea of, you know, isn't it interesting that you've, um, you're perfectly fine with Captain so-and-so uh, calling in an airstrike, but um, a, a, a like war strike, you know, Captain so-and-so can't do that. Um, why is that? And I, I, they kind of nod their head, but then I don't think they're there yet, ready to sort of delegate just now. Um, a, a greater concern for them is um, their own use of it. Uh, is, you know, they are not trained. So there's the organizational side of all of this, but there's also just how do they use it as a tool? They are expected to use it as a tool and a tool and everything from, um, speaking to an external audience to speaking to their own force and yet it's not woven into PME. Um, and it's actually why I did an article uh, last year on, it was like the seven lessons of um, personal social media use for leaders. Um, but that, that to them is an even greater challenge because it's, it's something they're expected to do and they're not trained on it. I hope that answers it kind of, that's my loose observation, but you all live it more than I do. Um, the second question was, um, what was it again? I'm blanking. Um, just the relative value of open source oh, oh, information. Uh, I, it, greater, greater than even the time in between because of both um, the sheer scale of it has only grown because we have more and more sensors that are out there. Um, we have more and more data collected. You have a longer history, therefore. Um, and then you've got the topic of burn-in uh, and also Dewan's company, uh, greater application of AI, machine learning, et cetera, to sift through it and draw out insights from all, all of that data that's out there. So I think uh, the OSINT side is, is only, only grown. Yeah, if you don't mind me adding a quick like, you know, end note this time. Um, I think, you know, um, you know, it's very easy to say that, well, we need to take more risk, right? And our senior leaders, you know, they're too risk averse, right? Um, I, I, I drink way too much scotch talking about that with, you know, civil affairs captains and majors and enlisted, you know, leaders. So I'm not going to go back there, right? But I want, want to encourage you to think about, you know, um, risk management, right? So, and I want you to get really tactical about how to mitigate risk aversion, right? And to me, there are two folds. Um, this is a two-fold like, you know, uh, answer. One is, you know, am I willing to iterate, right? You know, am I factoring in contingency risk factors, right, as part of my operational planning and execution, right? And this is not part of our doctrinal muscle memory yet. To me, you know, bitching about, you know, risk aversion, it's just not going deep enough, right? You got to start factoring in risk mitigation protocols in every plan, in every corner, right? 
So if a J39 campaign backfires, right, then you have essentially ready-made, right, backup solutions to mitigate such unintended consequences, part of your initial con op submission, right? And I think we're not there yet. To me, I think being very deliberate about factoring in risk mitigation in every con op, I think is really key, right? You do that, you demonstrate your ability to mitigate intended like, you know, consequences. I think we can lower it to perhaps to O5, right? Right now is more like a brigadier general minimum, right? If we can lower it to like an O5, right? Then that's a huge win. So, uh, last question uh, from us, at least, until we passed off these fantastic 12 questions, we got to narrow it down on the audience. And I um, would ask this. So one of the things we talk about specifically in Burnin is the economic impact of automation and AI. So I have, I'm, I'm a, I study economics and within any function, there is always the A, which is the technology and technology always reduces labor. So uh, I will couple this as a two part question. The first one is this, as follows. So within the book, we look very much specifically in the United States and the decrease in the amount of labor in the United States. And if you look at the McKinsey reports, the US is actually well positioned to respond to automation. So I will say first off, is that the case with a lot of the things we see in the book? Are we going to see a lot of job loss through the automation? And the second question is, how does that affect the international system? Specifically countries like China, which have a huge amount of their workforce that could be put out by automation in the snap of a finger. And one of our key allies in the global competition to China, which is India, which is developing himself as a secondary option to um, production manufacturing within the Indo-Pacific region. So I'll pass that off to you, Peter. Yeah, great question. Um, so again, going back to the concept of the book, um, you know, you're taking research but sharing it across. So uh, we actually pulled literally every um, job automation report that we could find. You mentioned the McKinsey one, and you know they ranged in length from like two pages to 200 pages. Um, and so there's McKinsey's is one of the more famous one. Um, uh, but you know, there's also PricewaterhouseCoopers, there's Oxford University, there's World Bank, there's OECDs, um, actually built an Excel spreadsheet. There's 1300 of these projections overall. So, you know, McKinsey says, um, 45% of jobs and then it breaks it down. Uh, PwC says, no, 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 it's 38%. Oxford says, no, 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 it's 49%. Um, and uh, you get to see the you know, kind of the wonderful curve and um, the low end estimate is um, 9%, that's OECD, 9% of jobs being um, uh, displaced or replaced is still pretty traumatic for an economy. Um, and again, some people will then say, oh, well, people will find new jobs. Well, you still have a transition period that's difficult. And, and I think this technology is different because it's not a story of one tool being swapped for another. It's not the farmer putting down their shovel and then going to work at the factory. Um, it's, it's true displacement. And we can already see this in certain levels. Um, uh, and, but we use the characters to, to make that real. Mm -hmm. So um, one area that actually the McKinsey report hits, but um, the Oxford, there's an Oxford study that's even better that looks at, 702 different individual professions and how they will be affected. Um, and the story that it tells is actually akin, and this is the key to me for, for your group, is that they're parallel, they all have parallels in the military. All of these civilian occupations have parallels in the military. And the story that they tell is that it's not the um, you know, blue collar, uh, it's not the factory worker or the truck driver, it's across the spectrum. It's um, high end as well. So one area was uh, the white collar job of contract lawyer. It's a field that makes around $200,000 a year. It's on its way, not to ending as a profession, but its numbers are going vastly down because you can automate huge portions of it. Um, and, but we make that real through the story of a character who's experiencing that. Okay, what does that number mean? in their home, in their marriage, in their politics. And um, so in the US, we're already starting to feel this. Uh, 
of the job loss among manufacturing over the last two decades, 85% of it was from automation. It, we, we can blame outsourcing to other countries, but the data is it was from automation. That also means that those jobs are not coming back. Even if you bring the factories back from a China or the like, you're not going to get the, the same juice from the squeeze. Um, so uh, we can already feel it in the US. I think it's going to be traumatic. Now, we're better positioned than most nations because we're a wealthy nation. We've got uh, high education levels, um, et cetera. However, uh, again, having a conversation earlier today, one of the other themes of burn in, and it relates to the social media side too, is we're a very brittle nation. Um, it's not that we are uh, weak. I, I mean, when I say brittle, our, everything from our critical infrastructure to our institutions outwardly look strong, but they're brittle. And um, again, whether it's the power grid to respect for democracy and rule of law, um, they have proven to be a lot more brittle than I think people want to uh, admit. And um, we're feeling that right now. Um, and burn-in shows that brittleness will continue and the threats to it will, will be increased. Um, so challenging for us, as you mentioned though, this ball plays out globally. There's a couple of really good studies at this that um, I think they paint a nightmare scenario for um, certain states that you might operate in. Uh, you look at a, a Bangladesh, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the percentage, but you know, it's something like 40% of its GDP is from the textile industry at a level that current robotics can automate cheaper than a human making clothing, let alone where we are 15, 20 years from now. I have a tough time seeing how, you know, a Bangladesh is going to make that transition because it, they can't talk about things like, well, maybe we could have universal basic income or, or you know, all these things that we talk about here. Um, so I think in a number of uh, states, it's going to be really challenging for China. Um, yeah, it, there's, uh, think about the Foxconn factory that, um, you know, it's part of the story of uh, the success of China over the last 20 years has been the move from people in the rural region into the cities working in factories. Those factories are starting to be automated mm -hmm. for pure cost saving reasons. So you have, you know, one Foxconn factory that currently employs 36,000 people. That thing's going to be automated down to a couple hundred people. It'll still have the same output. But, and so again, I don't know where they go. There's a transition period for China as well, just like for us. And so I think it um, really does, uh, and something we played with in, in Ghost Fleet is that um, when the regime can't offer the same level of economic growth, it does what authoritarian regimes have always done, which is looks for someone to blame, mm -hmm. and you blame internally or you blame externally. And, you know, we, we can see that, um, feel that already in coronavirus stuff. But I, I, I think in a longer economic downturn, um, you have a, a regime that becomes worried about its internal stability and so becomes actually more nationalist uh, in its rhetoric, uh, which I think raises the tension levels and maybe makes, it, um, it makes crises greater in, in likelihood. I think that's very important points, uh, Peter. And I think that you know, China, what people don't realize, also has the, the one plus two plus four demographic issue that a lot of people don't talk about. And it's only going to exacerbate that you have a welfare-based state, demographic issues, and you're losing your ability to employ your people. And coronavirus has also shown the ability to shift elsewhere. Um, so now it is time where we actually get these amazing questions we've got. So first, I'll pass it off to Mike, uh, to Kevin, who is our question master on this. Yeah, so I think it's uh, due time to start including the audience into this oh, uh, really, really fascinating awesome. discussion. I, in fact, actually, the first question do one, I think it really fits uh, your wheelhouse. This is coming from Thomas Pledger. Uh, oh, his, his question, <clears throat> he's asking about possibilities surrounding uh, American and Chinese competition on the African continent and the infrastructure that is usually required to collect some of the information that we're talking about. So, Thomas, if you're 
able to ask, uh, go right ahead. Hey, Thomas, how are you doing? Hey, hey, Duan. Hey, uh, Peter. How's everybody this evening? So um, my question largely centered around um, basically um, China's currently trying to um, isolate itself for resources so that we can continue to monitor its industry. Um, as we go forward, there's likely to be conflict in Africa. Africa, of course, doesn't have a large set of data sets in relation to the African populations. Um, how do we, is there a way that you can see to mitigate that in the future? And the sort of corollary to that is we're training a lot of our data sets on Western populations, a lot of our AI using Western populations. How do we help facilitate that when we get into third and fourth world countries where the data sets are completely different than they are here in the US and where we have Walmart and 7-Elevens? So I'll pause there. Yeah, that, that's a lot of questions, uh, Thomas. Um, you know, I'll just give you my two cents. Um, actually, there are like you know, three answers to your question. Number one, um, there is a lot of, you know, machine to machine, machine to machine translation uh, taking place, um, especially through machine learning. Well, that's a lot of machine, right? Uh, so in that sense, I think platform to platform compatibility is gonna be, less of an issue moving forward, right? And they're like, you know, um, there is a dirty secret about, um, you know, big data, quote and unquote, and that is platforms don't exist to serve users. Trust me about that. Platforms exist to collect user data and then commoditize the user data to the highest bidder, right? So I'll give you a very quick example. You know, you guys are all familiar with dark web sites, right? 2chan, 4chan, right? And then there is a lot of point-to-point -point encryption texting services like Telegram. And people tend to think that, oh my God, there's no way we can crack the code on those platforms. Uh, wrong. They sell the data uh, because platforms exist to make money. And the best way to make money is not by collecting membership fees, it's by selling user data, right? So it is well within the realm of possibility at this point. Uh, number three, going back to Africa, um, I think I wanna go back to like, you know, the opposite side of emerging technology that I was uh, talking about earlier, right? Um, the good news here is that uh, the Chinese are almost as racist as we are, right? So they make a lot of mistakes when they're overseas, right? So there are a lot of conversations, local conversations that we can listen to, right? So do we have leverage? Absolutely. Do we have the kind of technology to empower these local uh, grievances and you know, conversations? Absolutely, right? And to me, that's the whole notion of you know, great power competition and that it is we never go over the threshold of, you know, declared conflict, right? And, um, you know, I'll just, you know, add my final sort of, you know, footnote here, and that is, you know, my favorite, you know, analogy of, you know, emerging technologies that are so abundantly clear in burn in is really the Manhattan Project, right? You know, imagine that somebody else had weaponized nuclear power before us, right? Uh, that prospect is pretty grim if you, you know, if you think about it, right? And essentially when that technology was mature, it was couched within our institutional framework, right? And I see the same parallel about automation, artificial intelligence and et cetera, right? And that is unless these technological developments are couched within institutional resiliency. You know, I think that's how we determine what it may look like in the near future, right? And the same logic applies to Africa, right? So I think there are like you know, bigger, you know, political and like you know, policy implications that determine whether the prospect of proxy conflict will be pronounced in the African continent or not. So that's my two cents. It's a uh, great answer. I don't have much to add to it. Um, I think we'll jump on to the next one. It's a perfect answer. All right.
Uh, we'll be moving out on to uh, Megan O. Um, I think this one probably is, is best for you to start off with, Peter. Uh, so she's asking about the viability of the operational environment versus a newer concept of what she's calling the, the narrative environment. Uh, so Megan, if you're there, uh, feel free to, to speak up. Hey guys. Um, yeah, so I threw it in the chat box there. Uh, is there room to shift this concept of like operating environment to something broader, like a narrative environment? And if you think about like an umbrella, you know, like we uh, within the military would have an overarching narrative that everyone looks towards before they look into any operating environment. Um, and, uh, and then my next question is, is there an opportunity to blend um, new narratives with things that we're seeing like on Netflix and things that we're seeing uh, in Broadway and um, to where we can connect with, with wide audiences as well to address some of these really deep topics that you guys get into with your books. Thank you. Oh, wow. Well, um, on the first, uh, you know, it, 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 gosh, it, it so much depends on the, like the definition of what do we mean by operational environment and the like. And, you know, I mean, you all know these like doctrinal battles around it. Um, it for myself, it, it takes me back to a prior question where I, when we're thinking about planning, you know, we, we now have a, a process that allows us to very, you know, usually fairly quickly figure out, okay, land domain, you, you got this responsibility, you'll do X, Y, and Z. Air domain, you're in charge of that. Um, how do we deconflict in it? You know, we don't always do it perfectly, but we've, we've got that. We added in cyber domain, we're working out right now really what that means. Um, but the, the information space in terms of what, you know, what you're calling narrative there, the messaging side of it, um, we still don't do that well. And my observation of it, again, I'm the outsider to your community is, uh, if we do it, it's like at the end, um, okay, now we've come up with everything, or how are we going to communicate it as opposed to the way the others, we blend it all together. And, um, you know, we, we know that's not how the Russians do it. Uh, they tend to have things blended together a little bit more um, than we do. Um, so I th think that's, that's how I would think about, I guess, how I'm, I'm maybe not the, the, the best answer to you operationally, but um, that's my own framing of it. Um, the uh, need an opportunity for an intersection. Yes. Um, and I, I'm, I have two different projects on this. And if you guys have you know, ideas of how to get support for them, um, one is on the topic of, um, we initially did it on cybersecurity and we figured modeling after public health, uh, the greatest way that you could raise the level of um, cybersecurity uh, awareness was not through you know, uh, training modules or the like, it was actually weaving it into arts and entertainment. It's the same thing, for example, um, we have, we can show the studies on uh, breast cancer awareness. Is it, 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 there was a program that came out of the Paley Center that um, essentially got it into discussion in a bunch of different TV shows and movies. Um, and so what we did, uh, par partnership between New America and um, uh, UCLA is set up a series of um, essentially uh, boot camps and writers workshops uh, for Hollywood writers um, and movie writers, TV, you name it. Uh, and the idea is not to tell them what to write about, but to get them access to experts, to brief them on important issues. And then, then they run off and write, you know, their own inspirations from it. And um, it's already had some great impact. We've gotten uh, everything from top 10 TV shows to weave it into episodes uh, to entire new series um, pitched. Uh, and um, in turn, we did another where we brought a group of Hollywood writers to Washington, D.C. and took them around everywhere from CIA to they got briefed by people from Cyber Command. Um, it, it, so there's an interest, there's an appetite there. Um, we're, we'd love to explore how to do other topics uh, on that, in particular, um, related to disinformation and digital literacy. Uh, the problem is um, we're tin cupping around. Um, when people talk about disinformation and, um, the, and the problem that America faces, they, very, they always focus on the platform companies. Uh, what ought Facebook to do? Um, there's a lot of things Facebook ought to do, but it's not gonna be enough to deal with the need for 
the broader public to understand the basics of digital literacy. So um, we've been trying to get support for it, trying to figure out how to go after it. And then there's this uh, broader initiative um, in terms of kind of the toolkit that, that um, Vernon is representative of is uh, creative means of communicating um, and how do we essentially help other groups create their own burn-ins or their own ghost fleets for their topics? Um, how do we help everything from military units to corporations to civil society build their own narratives that blend in what's important to them and put it in a compelling way that reaches a larger audience and I, um, but is, but is research grounded. And so it's the idea of, you know, how do you do this as a practice as opposed to just specific to the topic of AI or whatnot. And again, you can see the application of that to um, the military side or the corporate side. All right, thanks, Peter, for that really fantastic answer. We're going to move on to Andy Duhon's question next. Uh, unfortunately, Andy has a bunch of kids running around that are preventing him from asking this directly. Uh, but he, he wrote a lot, but essentially to ask the question of, is the absence of human emotions and self-interest a net benefit for the national security enterprise's ability to make decisions? Or do you think that uh, you can never replace uh, human emotion in the decision-making process? Super deep question. I'll jump on that. I mean, I don't see how you always have human emotion woven into it. The, 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 the machine is informed by our experiences, our data, our designs. Um, maybe I'm just uh, not grasping the question completely, but um, the humans, shape the machines you know as we're saying before we have agency over how they're designed how they're deployed and oh by the way they're they're deployed into a, a human operating environment um uh, i think that maybe i'm getting to Andy, i'm sort of reading andy's question here um when we currently we're not processing the vert um uh user disconnection yeah i mean i think what 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 um he's getting at also the the distancing effect i mean a concern for me um is that those studies that find that people operate differently at a distance uh or when they see someone else as, as a data point rather than as a human um and of course there's there's war crimes versions of that but also just operational effectiveness issues too um so uh, yeah i guess i'm not answering it all that great but um I, I don't see how you. I don't see how you disconnect the discussion of technology from the human, and, and that's probably a, a peril that many of the engineers um, and designers get into, uh, and, and not just in the in the defense space, but it's one of the things that that um, uh, I think has been why um, companies like Facebook keep you know stumbling now more recently is because they they think they can engineer their way out of uh, very real human problems. Yeah, if Peter, you don't Peter, I think, yeah. Go on, James. I'll go after you. Well, I was going to ask, Peter, if I may add, so like if you look at AI in general and there's there's three basic types and there's narrow, there's general, and there's super general, and I might have the terms a little off, and it's is there still human agency above all those three types? If I can ask that as a follow-up to Andy's great question. Um, once we get into – general AI, maybe not, because that's when we get into, uh, you know, a whole realm we've never been before, but we're a long way off from, from that. Yeah, let me jump on this real quick. Um, and um, um, let me make it as realistic as possible. Like, you know, literally like two days ago, I received a tech demo from, you know, a startup company, and they were essentially using live video. Uh, to read emotions of people's, you know, faces, right? So essentially it has about like, you know, 30 different um, collection points on each face, right? In real time, it'll pop different, like, you know, types of emotion, right? And essentially there'll be a call-out box next to each face, right? And as you talk, as you change your facial muscles, right? It'll automatically essentially tabulate what kinds of emotions the AI is detect 
acting from your body language, facial expression, and so on and so forth. So this is not even like, you know, near future. This is like right now, right? What I'm trying to get at with this is that the human distinction between, right, logic and emotion, right, will be very much irrelevant in the next 10 years. So asking whether human emotion will be an integral part of how national security converges with emerging technology, right? To me, again, the question is the inverse, right? And that is the connection is a lot more fluid than most people realize, right? Where we draw the line, right? I think is the real question because if you look at some of the propaganda campaigns coming from authoritarian actors, right? What they do really well is weaponizing emotion to find the quickest cognitive shortcut to invade organic information environments, right? So twofold, right? We cannot avoid it, right? And the distinction is becoming blurrier than ever. And going back to your notion of human agency, right? This is where we draw the line, right? But the line itself is not you know, uh, preordained, right? It's very dynamic and very fluid at this point. Thank you, Kyle, or Kevin, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, interchangeable, me and Kyle, we're about the same. Uh, yeah, so that, that kind of, you know, along that propaganda lens and the, the information sphere, that kind of transitions us into Paul E's question. He's actually got two really good ones, one relating to the nuance of emotional triggering, uh, and then another one talking about the, the power of storytelling to sort of influence people to a certain action. So Paul, if you're up, uh, feel free to ask your question. Hey, Paul, you're muted. <clears throat> sorry. Um, sorry for the dark screen um, and the mute. It's uh, quite late here in the UK. Um, it's really related to both uh, Megan's questions, the conversation overall, um, and also the AI side of things. Um, so starting off with my observation is machine learning and AI right now is really good at recognition and replication, but it's not really understanding. So when we're talking about utilizing AI or, or bots in communication, surely it's going to fail beyond the most rudimentary communications because it's not understanding emotional triggering. And I'm wondering what the, the you guys as experts would, would think about that or whether I'm a little bit naive in my current understanding. Um, and then following on for that into the narrative space, narrative is, is, is described as uh, describing what's going on. It's the synopsis. It's, it's the, the movie pitch, the episode pitch, whereas stories is the articulation of that narrative. And we tell different stories to different audiences to determine what effects we want. And it's the storytelling that we seem to forget about when we're professional. Or is that simply a semantic differentiation? Narrative and stories are interchangeable. And linked to that, to, to Megan's point, the operations, the physical domain, is the illustration of that story. And it's, it's closing that say-do gap that makes those stories believable and tellable. So I'll, I'll jump on that. Um, on the first question, uh, one of the characters in the, in the book um, plays that out and, and discusses, and really what you're getting at is the difference between um, sentience and sapience. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about robots, when we talk about robot sentience, you know, the, the way it's typically thought of is the whole, you know, it, it becomes sentient and then it, it kills all the humans. But when you break down the actual definitions of them, um, sapience, and, and, and what's funny about this is like, now we're having philosophical discussions, right? You know, they're both sci-fi philosophical discussions. We're moving from, but they're also crossing into our real world. Sapience is about the, the, the actual understanding of something. So, you know, it's that idea of um, a robot may be able to uh, identify the markers of one that is in love, but it can't understand love. Um, and, uh, that, that's really kind of what you're, you're getting at. And that will, the question is, um, and, and we don't yet know is how much does its inability to cross into sapience limit its 
utility in the real world? Um, what, what, what does it not allow to do since it can't move? It can become sentient, not in the, the sci-fi way, but it, you know, it can understand something, but it can have that deeper understanding um, because it, tr it is a machine. Um, how does that limit its, its ability? Um, how does that limit Mark Zuckerberg's ability that, that uh, <laughs> he can understand love? Um, uh, so, um, and then your qu second question was, oh, narrative and story. Um, honestly, I think it's actually, we use narrative because if you say story, it sounds so soft. Uh, I, you're right. There's a difference, but, but it's, um, you know, narrative is like the, the professional strategic way of talking about it. If, if I went around saying the power of story, uh, as, as a tool, um, you know, definitely I would not get the, the senior leader to listen. But if I say, you know, the power of narrative and nonfiction mixed, um, okay. It sounds a little more, narrative sounds more technical. Um, one thing that's interesting to you though, is that you talked about the physical environment and how it's the illustration. An interesting thing to play with that will become real that, you know, we, we, we explore a little bit in burn in is with augmented reality, the real world becomes a green screen. So it is real, but you can put over it what either you, the user wants, or someone else can inject in that to make people see things that they want. Um, and so the very same wall, for example, uh, at a protest may have different digital graffiti put onto that wall. So two people at a protest may see in the real world totally different images. And this again, you know, we already see this right now kind of in, you know, uh, the way we look at, you know, what a, what a pro is a protester uh, legitimate or illegitimate, whatever is what I'm getting at though, is that now we have looming the digital means to truly affect what people see so that we will all have our own tailored view of the real world. Thank you guys. Very informative. Uh, Peter Duan. So we have one more question. Uh, would you guys mind going maybe a couple minutes over if that's okay? Yeah. Fantastic. And I, I, a quick promotion to our Unomia journal. There was a fantastic article that came out today about tribalism in the new digital world of 2035. That is exactly what you're speaking of. It's people specifically picking pre-tailored uh, AI designed images and uh, narratives. And I highly recommend everybody reads it. I'll repost in the chat for everybody and I'll pass it back off to Kevin to give it to our last question. So the last question is coming from uh, David Kearns. He's got a question about how you feel uh, or what level of commitment you think the DOD should have to transparency as we sort of absorb all these um, futuristic uh, technologies and stuff like that. So without further ado, David, if you would. Can you hear me all right? Okay, uh, so you guys kind of touched on it uh, earlier, uh, but essentially my question is, you know, as we look at where we're at, um, where the, the Department of Defense wants to be at with operations in the information environment, and then where our adversaries are at, uh, what responsibilities or commitments, and I think what I really mean by that is how should we constrain ourselves uh, when we look at operations in the information environment? Do you think we should stay uh, relatively above the board, uh, maintain openness, transparency, honesty, uh, in the hope of maintaining legitimacy? Or do you think there's room for more of an offensive take on that? Uh, and what would that look like? I'm, maybe I'm, I'm too much of an optimist, but uh, I, I still believe we're better advantaged by um, having that, that more transparent mode um, by sticking to our our core values. Um, I think uh, it's more effective for us. Um, and in that competition that we've talked about of, you know, the, the states caught in the middle, 
um, where you know you will be operating that you know we hope that they will be our allies but there is a, you know someone's referencing Africa or the like that there's also a push by a China or et cetera you know you've got these two very different models and um, I want ours to be a model that's an, I think that is a more attractive model maybe not to the leaders of those countries but definitely to the populace um, maybe that's me being too optimistic, but uh, that's that's what I hope. And again, you know, when we look at these, um, but it, um, you know, it's a, I, you're a different kind of audience than the normal one. So you know, normally, people, I think you get it a little bit better. That we we need to learn from other nations' experiences. And you know, for example, when it comes to influence operations, um, yes, you can learn from a Russia and China, but we got a lot of learning to do from the Estonias and Finlands of the world. And uh, same thing when you think about, a, um, you know, whether it's I'm going back to Estonia, digital economy, digital voting. Um, we don't do a good job of learning from other nations. And what they do is not, you know, Estonia is not good at this space because it's really good at censorship. It's, it's actually, you know, far more transparent. So um, I think we, we, we need to do a better job of pulling that in. And it's interesting because uh, it, it, at New America, where I work, um, like every other organization, we're sort of wrestling with um, what are larger strategic pivots we need to do in a post-coronavirus world and our role of trying to help a broader America. And one that we, you know, identified is um, the problem America has of incorporating lessons from other nations, writ large, whether it's public. I mean, we see this in the public health, right? Other nations did better than we did. Democracies did better. Why is that? How do we go after that? But it's also in you know, the way other nations handle voting, handle uh, provisions of um, welfare. To, there's, we don't do a great job at this in military doctrine. I mean, we, we, we partner decently well, but we're always the ones wanting to teach rather than the other way around. Um, and so that's, again, it's my larger trend of getting it. Uh, I don't think we have to um, give up being transparent to be effective. Uh, I think also there are like you know, two really important implications that I want to add to Peter's account. Uh, number one, we have to think about uh, possible second order and third order effects of not going after transparency because they can really restrict your operational freedom of movement down the road, right? So if there is a different regime governing transparency about data usage, right? It can gravely impact how you operate in contested countries and regions, right? And this is why important that number two, right? I'm not going to be as apologetic as Peter, but do not underestimate how we shape different governing regimes in the rest of the world, right? We can set the pace in terms of what kind of policy should be in place for exploiting or using PAI and PII, right? And, and the reason is that a lot of times we try to find a shortcut because we are lazy, not because we don't know how to crack the code on the problem set, right? And I think it has really far reaching implications. A, it can essentially set the tone for the rest of the world in terms of how data is used for national security and perhaps domestic law enforcement, right? And number two, right, it's not a foreign concept. It can really impact how you maneuver in contested areas. I've seen it in several countries in the Pacific Rim, right? I've seen a lot of it in the Baltic states, in the Balkans, right? So this is a real operational challenge and we have to own this policy debate in order to essentially maintain at least the same level of freedom of movement overseas. I think that's a fantastic uh, note to end on. And I, I will just follow that. I will footnote you, uh, oh, Duwan, because yeah. you've been even the footnoter tonight is um, well, we, we had a Peter. Uh, you do not talk about him directly. You only footnote or endnote Peter. Well, it's you don't talk about Fight Club and you don't talk about Peter. I've 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 learned that tonight. <laughs> you'll you'll be a character in a future novel if you do. Hey Peter, if you need a North Korean, you know, protagonist or antagonist, here I am. 
So, I mean, talking about information space, we talked about this last time is, I mean, there's a reason why, and this is just the sharp power once again, is the reason why the original plan for Red Dawn version two was not the originally be planned PRC's invasion of the United States. That was once again, their sharp power and their ability to control the information space. So that's a funny thing to add to that right now. So uh, with that being said, uh, I think you hit it right on the head and I, I've heard this even in Afghanistan, which we have some of the most information space limited individuals is we will, and us and our, our partners will have tactical victories in which the Taliban and other agents will have information space domination because our processes are too slow to catch up with them and they will win the strategic victory in that or operational victory in that. And I think it's a great place to close. So at this point we're, uh, we're closing out. I'm going to pass to Kyle, who's going to talk about some of the CAA initiatives. And then the three of us will ask you guys one final quick question and then we'll reverse the tables and allow you guys to ask us one question because we just can't be the only folks that get questions asked to them. So Kyle to you, my good friend. All right, so a quick rundown of uh, upcoming events uh, for the audience. We have two writing contests ongoing right now. Um, the Divergent Options Contest, the deadline is 7 July. Uh, 1,000 words, option or assessment paper, uh, examining the role of human factors in armed conflict uh, in the world of 2035. Uh, all these details are on our website for you to check out. Then we have the Team Room Writing Contest, deadline is 15 June. Uh, and that's anything you believe will make a civil affairs team more effective in training or operation. Uh, and the best article at that point will be awarded uh, a certificate for a free Glock handgun. Uh, finally, later in the fall, uh, there's a civil affairs association call for papers, uh, basically write about any way in which uh, civil affairs can become a greater force for influence operations. And that'll be due in late August. And then, uh, our next KLE uh, with Nadia Shadlow, author of uh, the 2017 National Security Strategy and War and the Art of Governance will be next week, uh, 15 June. Uh, still working out the time, but it'll be published. So we're looking forward to seeing everybody back. Um, Kevin, you got one last question? That's it for questions. Uh, just wanna highlight uh, the five of you who so graciously spoke up and asked your questions will be receiving in uh, EJ, you, you know me a journal coin in the mail, so uh, thank you for participating. Well, as the loud mouth of the group, I will ask uh, a question with a follow up. So, um, in the story, we really focused, uh, and that's burning once again. So, please follow the link that's provided in the slideshows. We'll post it back out. Go out and get burning. You got a discount, I think it's like 15 to 20 percent. It's a great novel, reads fast. Unfortunately, some of the stuff happens right next to my house, but where I grew up in, but we'll, we'll, we'll forgive Peter on that. So my question goes is, my two questions goes as first. So number one is the, the antagonists of the story uh, are both, um, and the protagonists are both non-state actors. Peter, do you feel in the paradigm of 2050 that the non-state actor will have a greater influence in the international system? That's my first question. And my second question is for both Duan and Peter, and Duan, you can ask the first one you want, is when will we get to the fact that we've moved from um, narrow AI into general AI? Just best guess, we won't hold it against you. That's my question. Uh, on the first, because of the way that you um, answered it, uh, sorry, asked it, I can dodge it. You, you just said greater. So yes, greater than now. I don't have to answer whether I think greater than state powers or not. I'm, I'm not certain of that, but yeah, we individual, and again, you know, you keep saying 2050, uh, we don't put a year on it. It could be set in 2030, 2035, um, maybe 2023. Um, what I'm getting at is that one of the trends it explores is the, the idea of super empowered individuals and not superpowers, but the, but that individuals have the ability to um, take actions that states used to dream of being able to do. And that is true whether it is, um, you know, plot spoil, one person uh, holding hostage the entire city of DC through cyber means, or in your world, um, influence operations, uh, one person able to fund a campaign 
uh, that could, you know, um, steer an entire national election, et cetera. And then, uh, sorry, what was your second question again? Was um, uh, what was it? No, it simply is when your best guess. Oh, general AI. General versus um, narrow. When do you think will actually hit general AI? Best guess. At least a generation out. And as Arthur C. Clarke said, once you move a generation out, you're in the realm of not science, but magic. So my question goes, are you a Philip K. Dick or an Asimov in terms of the general AI? Uh, Asimov. Definitely. Um, I'll, I'll just add my two cents. Um, and since this are uh, the last minutes, uh, let me be a little bit philosophical. Um, and I think general AI is already here. In fact, you know, Peter may look like a human being, but it's just a AI projection, right? So you're looking at the onset of general AI already. In fact, I have this strong hypothesis that he is actually up from another planet. He has seen the future, right? And he came here just to help us prevent the most dystopian manifestation of what he has seen already, right? So that's my take on general AI. Oh, that's fantastic. And Peter, I will not give you the Voight, uh, was it Voight Camp test from Blade Runner? Uh, <laughs> with some of the turtles and stuff like that. So no, thank you gentlemen so much. And I will now return the favor to you guys. We've been grilling you for a while. Do you have any questions for us or the audience? Oh, wow. I will leave this as an open question. You are all um, professionals in this and you are professionals in a community. How do I spread the word about this book effectively or, uh, or, or, or more effectively? Where are the outlets where the people uh that um this should be in so i'll, I'll and and if you've got and obviously not answers right now but um please reach out to me afterwards you are the specialist in this what is the campaign that i need to be doing uh all the more and um uh back to i think it was megan's question uh an incredibly difficult whether we would want to call it operating environment or narrative environment um and, and one that's incredibly challenging. How do I spread the word about it? Where do I go? What do I get it into? Thanks. Do you want any for them for us? I think Duan's frozen. So if you want to close it out, Sheesh. Yeah. So, oh, Duan's back. Duan, do you have anything for us? Uh, yeah. So um, it's very simple. Um, I want you guys to think, you know, challenge yourself to, you know, um, operationalize what I call uh, digital civil reconnaissance. To me, that is really how all domains will collapse within the context of a power competition, right? So a lot of, you know, uh, discrete domains will collapse in coming years, right? Uh, whether that's technological or like, you know, uh, warfare driven, those domains will collapse. And the idea is how do we stay ahead of that collapse, right? And if you have questions, engage us back, right? But whoever cracks the code on how to stay ahead of the power curve, right? I think that is really the like the most important question of our times. Now this is Thank you both. And Duan, you hit it, and Peter hit it the same way. And this is the pressing issue of the next, not 50 to 100, to uh, maybe 150, 200 years. How we're, ex how we're adapting to these giant fundamental changes. So, um, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time this evening. I know we went a little bit over, but I think there's some fantastic questions that need to be hit upon. Uh, thanks to my guest host, as old Duan. Thank you so much for being a guest host tonight. Um, and once again, I will. Reiterate the fact that there's a link within this uh, KLE RSVP to go get a discount on Peter's book. Uh, not only the fact that it takes place right in my backyard, which is you know, a little bit disturbing, but I'm in a DC sprawl, um, but you can still appreciate things like the fact that there's still traffic in DC after AI, and there's some pretty good jokes about that, but it is really a pressing book. It really hits upon the fundamental changes that are going to happen when we automate and AI our society. So um, I'll leave it at that. 
I'll open the mic for 10 seconds left. If anybody has anything else to say, do want you raise your hand. So please, I'll give you closing comments, good sir. No, no, I, I was going to say bye-bye, but I just want to say, you know, thank you to Peter for doing this. You know, he is a super busy guy. He is in high demand. You know, it was really out of his good heart to, to like, you know, do this for us. So my thank you goes to Peter. And let's do this again next week with August Cole about the same book. How about that? <laughs> Thanks everybody again for having me. And, and my final word is stay well out there. Thank you right. so much. Yep. So I'll close it down here and everybody have a safe night. Uh, there's troubling times. Uh, with every way you fall on the spectrum, please keep yourself and your family safe and know that uh, there are better times in the future and we will get through this.